difference. Now we will be continuing with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which are covered under the competency 1.16. In this session we will be discussing about rheumatoid arthritis. This is a presentation you see in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So you can see these knuckleheads over here which are Boutonnier's deformities. You see this swan neck deformity which is over here and this is a hellas valgus deformity which you can see on the big toe. These are the deformities with which the patients present. Usually these deformities present late. Now try to understand the pathogenesis. The initiating antigen is believed to be binding to this tall like receptor called as TLRs which are a pattern recognition molecules which bind to both foreign and self-initiated structures and they are present on the dendritic cells as well as macrophages. Now once they are binding to this tall like proteins it causes a release of lymphoid cells into the joint over here. The primary response of activation of this tall like receptors is lymphoid cell infiltration which takes place in the joint that is in the synovium across the joint. There is formation of new blood vessels over here as well as there is an osteoclastic activity which starts destroying the joint. You can clearly see in this component here on the other half of the joint which is representing a rheumatoid arthritic joint. This synovium becomes locally invasive which is called as panis and the osteoclast it destroys the joint. The chronic inflammation process is initiated by the T cells which migrate into the joint over here and once they migrate into the joint they cause release of inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukin 1. These further activate and result in release of further cytokines over here which produce an inflammatory response and which cause destruction of the joint. If you can see over here the consequence of all these processes which is because of the release of these cytokines it results in erosive and inflammatory joint damage. The disease modifying anti-rheumatoid arthritis drugs called as DMARDs which include sulfasalazine, antimalarials, liflonamide they are going to be acting at this point over here and hence they are used very commonly. In addition to this, when we use immunosuppressants, they are going to be acting on the TD cells, CD4 cells and activated Th1 lymphocytes over here. Specific cells which are targeting the therapies, the monoclonal antibodies which are targeting the B cells, those which are expressing CD20 is rituximab, then we have anti-TNF alpha drugs like infliximab and then we have anti-interleukin 1 receptor inhibitors like anakinra and anti-interleukin 6 receptor antagonists like toclizumab. So we will talk about the therapy that how these therapies are used. Needless to say the use of glucocorticoids is very important because they help in suppressing the activated macrophages by blast which are further causing the release of interleukin 1, interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Remember the ubiquitous gene transfer factor that is NFK beta, they are responsible for cell activation and cytokine production which contributes to joint destruction. So going to use these therapies, we can use agents like methotrexate, we'll be using DM, other DMRDs like sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, liflunamide over here. We can use abatacept which would be affecting at the CD80 and CD86 expressing macrophages over here, rituximab which will be acting on the B cells expressing CD20 cells, anti-TNF alpha, anti-interleukin 1 receptor antagonist and anti-interleukin 6 receptor antagonist. So as a result of which, as compared to a normal joint, in a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, there would be a swollen, inflamed syvovium and joint, which is because of expression of these cytokines over here. There could be a hyperplastic synovial lining. There could be erosion of cartilage and periarticular bone, and these are going to destroy the joint. Just try to look at another way in which we are seeing that there is 
a bone loss or erosion because of osteoclastic activity there is also a cartilage loss which you see over here the synovium is inflamed the joint capsule is inflamed and there could be a generalized bone loss needless to say it is very important to institute the therapy at the earliest so that we can avert the damage which could happen to the damage which can happen to the joint and which can result in various deformities which i showed you in the beginning itself so when we are going to treat rheumatoid arthritis our goals are the first one is to relieve the pain second is to reduce the inflammation the third is to protect the articular structures fourth is to maintain the function of these joints and lastly to control the systemic order to do so we use drugs which are acting at different targets i have enumerated the various targets in the site of action earlier now first of these agents obviously it's involving joints which is causing pain there is arthritis needless to say we will be using non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs we have already talked about the various non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs which are used in rheumatoid arthritis these include as simple as ibuprofen these include diclofenac naproxen and even indomethacin remember the role of these non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs is basically to produce pain relief and to suppress inflammation to some extent needless to say the basic agent that we need to use over here is disease modifying anti rheumatoid agents which are also called as demards so the various demards include immunosuppressants classically when we talk about immunosuppressants the drug which is the cornerstone of therapy as per the current recommendations that is methotrexate in addition to methotrexate we can use a number of other drugs also like sulfasalazine liflonamide hydroxychloroquine which is an anti malarial drug azathioprine cyclophosphamide earlier we used to use cyclophosphamide also but it is only limited when there are systemic manifestations we earlier also used penicillamine d penicillamine and gold compounds but we have better responses with the other drugs that we have discussed over here so they are not longer preferred the second group of drug which are going to modify the disease is biological response modifiers so biologics they are forming a cornerstone of treatment of dmrds but the only problem is they are quite expensive they carry a risk of producing increase in infections reactivation of tuberculosis and other issues which are there these agents are basically given parenterally so first we have tnf alpha blocking drugs as we saw that one of the major cytokine which is responsible for producing a damage is tnf alpha In addition to TNF alpha we have interleukin 1 and also we have interleukin 6. So the drugs which block TNF alpha are infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, sertolinumab and etanercept. We also use other drugs like adapacept, rituximab, anakinra which is basically acting at interleukin 1. corticosteroids which are immunosuppressants remember they can only be used or they are used initially as a bridging therapy by the time we get a response to dmrds now coming on to the first of these agents that is immunosuppressants that is methotrexate methotrexate we already have covered under a number of indications it's a potent immunosuppressant and an anti inflammatory agent it is used for immunosuppression in various diseases it is also used in rheumatoid arthritis it is used in rheumatoid arthritis because it inhibits amino imidazole carboxymide ribonucleotide transformulase as well as it also inhibits thymidylate synthase which is the major action for its anti cancer effects the inhibition of amino imidazole carboxymide ribonucleotide transformulase and thymidylate synthase results in increase in the concentration of amino imidazole carboxymide ribonucleotide and amp as a result of which they cause increase in adenosine which is a potent inhibitor of inflammation in addition to this methotrexate also inhibits the proliferation as it is a anti proliferation agent It also stimulates apoptosis in immune inflammatory cells. It also inhibits the release of 
pro-inflammatory cytokines and this is the major reason in addition to inhibition of inflammation that it is going to be useful in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Another advantage of methotrexate is it has a rapid onset of action and it is sustained. Methotrexate can be used orally or parenterally if the patient is not able to tolerate the oral dose. We gradually increase the dose for methotrexate. The ADRs which are associated with use of methotrexate are nausea, it can cause mucosal ulcerations, there is risk of hepatotoxicity, it can cause gastric irritation, can cause stomatitis and also can cause bone marrow suppression. So those patients who are on methotrexate therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, we have to get a repeated liver function test and hemogram for the early detection of hepatotoxicity and bone marrow suppression. Big member, because this is drug which is immunosuppressant, it's an anti-cancer drug. So therefore it is contraindicated in ladies who are pregnant, ladies who are breastfeeding, patients who are having a liver disease, patients who are having some infection because of immunosuppression there would be flaring up of the infection, those who are having a leukopenia and those already have an acid peptic disease. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis with any one or more than one combination of these conditions, we cannot use methotrexate. We try to minimize the toxicity by use of leucovirin. We already have explained the leucovirin, which is nothing else but folinic acid. Remember here, we need not use folinic acid because we are going to be using it once a week therapy over here. It is not going to be there. It does not require a rescue at this point of time. And therefore, we do not use a rescue for disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid.